Good morning. Good morning, everyone who's here. Those of you who may see this via YouTube or on the church web page, so glad you're all here today. Hope you enjoyed your week. Did you all notice the change in our weather when the humidity decided that it would subside a little bit? Did it feel better? God's given us a little break. Our lesson today will be lesson uh, one for September the 5th, 2021. We'll be in unit one, God's people offers praise. And our subject today will be celebrating with song. Celebrating with song. The devotional reading today will come from the 105th Psalm, verses 1 and 2, and 37 through 45. Our background scripture today comes from Exodus 1, Exodus 14, 1 through 15, 21. And I print it. Message for today comes from Exodus 15 and verses 11 through 21. Exodus 15, verses 11 through 21. Let us begin with prayer before I get into this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day and the opportunity. We thank you, Lord, for these moments with your word. We thank you, O Lord, for your very presence as we study. We pray, O God, that you will allow your spirit to reveal the hidden truths that are contained within your words today. Help us to understand what Moses and the people were going through at that time. And give us more clarity, Lord, on what we should do and how we should celebrate you with our praise, with our song. Thank you, O oh God, for keeping the church and the church family. Thank you, Lord, for blessing those among us who are sick and those, O oh Lord, who are caring for their sick loved ones. We pray that you strengthen them and keep them. Bless the man of God of this house and ever bless this house, Lord. Thank you for the 141 years, and we pray, O oh God, that you continue to bless us, that we may be a beacon of light in this dark world. In, in Jesus' name, name God, God, I pray. And then they had this Amen. rabble riser that was bringing about some new language. And so they didn't really believe. But, but, but when God took them all down, he said, in the end, they would realize that I am the Lord. And Miriam, <coughs> the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbre in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dance. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and his rider has been thrown into the sea and, and so we see now after all of this they began and it's interesting uh where it began it says miriam did even though the song is accredited to moses but it said miriam struck up a hymn and, and, and the other women followed her, and they sang praises to our God. So that's one uh, uh, of the acts of God that brought about praise for his people. There should be uh, some things, according to our lesson, that maybe we should find reason or find cause to be able to sing to God for the things he's done in our lives are uh, the things he does daily. One of the things is just waking us up. 
and, 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 and so then some of the conversations we would be having about songs we would not have because the true reason for us singing in a place like this in a worship center in a sanctuary is because we are singing to our God about the great things that he done for our lives God bless you I hope you got something made it that might benefit you as you began uh, your days after today and help you to focus on maybe why we really are singing praises. Because God is due all our praises. And, and, and it is our responsibility, not only uh, uh, to sing praises to the Lord before one another, but sing praises to the Lord before all mankind so that they will know who the Lord is and, and he's not only our Lord, he's theirs. And like I told you, the sanctuary, one of the things uh, I want to leave you with, getting to Christ, remember I said about Christ? <laughs> the blood that was shed uh, in Egypt bought the freedom for the Israelites. The same blood that Christ shed brings us freedom. They entered into, remember the sanctuary that God instructed them how to do, how to build, what it should be made out of, and how to worship. Uh, that blood of Jesus brings us into the sanctuary of God, the most holy place, the place where uh, we got some, 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 some friends up there, the angels are uh, yet singing praises to God, and, and, and we hope to be part of that group one day in the true sanctuary, singing praises to our God. <laughs> this morning we're going <clears> to <throat> begin with the blood never loses its power. It's here 146. The blood will never lose its power. Oh yes. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength from day Today it will never lose its power. It reaches to the high, yes, mountain. It flows. Valley, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. My doubts and calms my fear, and it dries all my tears. The blood 
that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power it reaches to the highest it flows to the lowest valley oh, the blood that gives me strength day to day it will never It will never lose its power. It will never lose. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture this morning will come from Psalms 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sits in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be, be like a, a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly should not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Yes, sir. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and more importantly, the doers of his word. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we come now in the name of our Son, Jesus, to say thank you for another day's journey, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to rise up this morning, Heavenly Father, but not only did you wake us up, Lord, you allowed us to get up this morning, Heavenly Father. But Lord, we realize that their son woke up this morning, Heavenly Father, but they were not able to get up without the assistance of someone else, Heavenly Father. But you blessed us this morning, Heavenly Father, to be able not only to get up, but to come to the house of prayer one more time, Heavenly Father. So we said thank you this morning, Lord. Thank you for this blessing, Heavenly Father, that thou hast bestowed on us this morning, Lord. Ask, Lord, that you will bless all that have come this morning. Bless those who have left their different home once again, Lord, to be able to come to the house of prayer one more time, Heavenly Father. Bless those, Lord, who had a desire, Lord, which we know there are many, Lord, who had a desire to come this morning, Lord, but was not able to come this morning, Heavenly Father. But, Lord, we come this morning to uplift our holy name. For truly you're worthy this morning, Lord, for you brought us from the early existence of our life, even when we did not know you, Lord. Deep in sin, thou commanded thy love toward us, Heavenly Father. So we just come this morning just to return some humble thanks, Lord, saying thank you for being mighty good to it, Lord. Lord, we ask you to continue to bless us and keep us, Lord. Bless those that are sick among us, those in the hospital and nursing home, Lord, and those who are sick at home. But, Lord, we ask that thou would just go in. But we realize this morning, Lord, if you'll just send forth your word, for there's healing in your word, there's deliverance in your word, there's saving power in your word. Lord, send forth your word this morning, Lord, and help us, Lord, to hide that word in our heart that we may not sin against thee, Heavenly Father. Lord, we ask this morning that if it be thy will, Lord, continue to bless our children, Heavenly Father. Help us to be good examples unto them, Heavenly Father. Help us to walk up right before them, that they may see thy good works and glorify thy Father, which is in heaven. Lord, help us this day, Lord, to be able to do those things which you have so charged us to do, Lord. Help us this morning, Heavenly Father, for we need you, Heavenly Father. For we're living in a mean world, Heavenly Father, where man would rather do wrong than to do right, Heavenly Father. 
but we look to the hills from which forth cometh our help. Yes. All of our help comes from thee and thee alone this morning. So we said thank you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us once again to be able to come into this house, Heavenly Father. Realize, God, Lord, that there was time when we were not able, Lord, but you have blessed us this day, Heavenly Father. Yes. So, Lord, we ask you to bless your servant this morning who will proclaim your word unto your people, yes. that we not only be healed, Lord, but we be doers of your word, Heavenly yes. Father. Help us today, Lord, to go into the hedges and highways and compare mankind, Lord, to come in yes. for their safety in the house, their love in the house, yes. their joy in the house today, Heavenly Father. But then, Lord, we realize that this is not our home, Lord. And one day we must do like others, Lord. We must answer the call, Heavenly Father. You told us that hymn books and Bibles will be closed. Won't have to study one no more. Won't have to worry about the troubles of this old world, Lord. We just ask this morning if it be thy will, Lord, that thou receive us into your kingdom. But, Lord, we just want to be somewhere around your throne. Did he you say, well done, thy good and faithful servant? You've been faithful over a few things. Come a little higher and I'll make you rule over me. Yes, My prayer for Christ's sake. Amen and thank Amen. God. Lord, keep me day by day in a pure and perfect way. I want to live, I want to live in a building not made by hand. Hit me with this one time. Lord, keep me day by day in a pure and per. Come on, you know that. I want to live, I want to live in a building not made. Just one more time. Mm -hmm. Lord, keep me day in a pure and perfect. I really want to live, I want to live in a building. Will you pray with me? Father, in the name of the Lord, we thank you. You brought us here. Our times are in your hands. We thank you for everything you've allowed us to endure and encounter. We thank you for the rivers and the valleys, the mountains and the peaks. God, we thank you for the good and the bad. We thank you in life. We thank you in the illness. We thank you for it all. Now, great and awesome God, we pray now in the wonderful name of Jesus for just a touch. For we know that a touch from you will cool our scorching fevers. It's a touch from you will cause dungeons to shake and chains to fall off. Just one touch from you will open blinded eyes and unstopped ears. God, just one touch from you will heal what troubles us the most. Touch in the name of Jesus. God, I pray now for that, that man, that woman, that boy, that girl, standing at the crossroads of confusion, not knowing which way to turn. Oh, God, help them to realize that they have a soul to save or one to forever lose. God, I pray for the careless and the unconcerned. I pray for the sick and those who are wrestling to recover. Oh God, in the wonderful name of Jesus, I pray that you will give us a glimpse of your glory. Allow us to come as close to you as we can stand it. Forgive us of everything that we have ever done wrong. Pray now, God, that we stand before you faultless to receive your great grace. God, I pray for that mother, that, that father who has had to say, uh, farewell to a son or daughter because of the present pandemic and situations. God, I pray right now for the bereaved that you would bind up their broken hearts and help them understand that earth really do, earth has no sorrows that heaven cannot heal. Bless the congregation. Bless those who join us by airwaves. Bless those who had a desire to be here but not able to make it. God bless us in ways we've not even sought to ask you. 
And we've done everything that you have assigned us to do down here. Pray that you'll find something in our lives so pleasing that you will give our souls a smooth and easy admittance into your eternal favor. We pray this prayer in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Thank God. Amen. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord, whose love has no limits, whose grace knows no measure, whose powers no boundaries known un to men, didn't God? How I love it. I love. I love the teaching. That he he he's a good teacher. Can you say Amen? amen. And um, I feel like those of old who said, "Of Jesus, did not our heart burn within, while the man of God spake with us by the way, and opened to us the words of life?" Thank you for clarity, and thank you for a clear um, expository teaching. My friends, I want to solicit an interest in your attention to the Book of Philippians chapter 3. Uh, the book of Philippians chapter 3, which is a very familiar passage of scripture. I want to begin reading with verse 1 and make our way down to verse 11. Amen. Although we are settled down on verse 10, Philippians 3, a very familiar passage of scripture, one of those passages of scriptures that we probably grew up uh, reading and studying in revivals when I was really young. Um, this was for some, for some preachers this was a revival text. Uh, uh, the, the thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that it is self-revelatory. And God reveals to us that which God wants us to know um, at the time we need it the most. Philippians 3, beginning with verse 1. And our celebration text will be verse 10. Where we'll make our way all the way down to verse 11. Finally, Paul is writing, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, I'm blameless. But what things were gain to me? Those I counted loss for Christ. Verse 8. Yea, doubtless, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Ushers, please, you may be seated. Uh, first things first. I want to talk to you briefly. Uh, first things first. Uh, my brothers and sisters, a close examination of the Christian life reveals that it is a life that is structured, ordained, and purposely lived in the image of Christ. The Christian life 
is modeled after Christ Jesus, who is the chief architect of our faith. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, he is the standard by which we measure, evaluate, and compare our own lives. He is the proof that changed life is no longer resembling a life of sin. Can you say amen? Now what do we find in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17? Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But how can all things be come new when we place old values and old attitudes and old behaviors in a new context? How can all things become new when we value all things in a new context? When we think the same things we thought before we fell in love with Christ as we did after we fell in love with Christ, how can old things become new when we think the same about God after we met him as we did before we ever really knew him. Well, partly because we value what does not matter more than we value what really does matter. It's as if we major in the minor and minor in the major. As if we place emphasis on things that matter the most now but matter very little in life eternal. My friends, I want to tell you, it is a dangerous and ungodly thing to place more emphasis on worldly habits than kingdom principles. Oh, y'all might as well say amen. It is a useless thing to be more concerned with how we look than how we live. How much wealth we possess rather than whether or not we are possessed by the Holy Spirit. After all, the Lord asked us in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8 and verse 36, for what shall it profit a man or a woman to gain the whole world and in the end lose his own soul? In other words, even if it were possible to gain everything in this world, what will it profit us to have all of that? And in the end, hear the master say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I want to tell you, my friends, it is useless to gain everything we can see, feel, or touch and not be able to exchange it for just one day in paradise. So the Lord Jesus in the Gospel of Mark asked the question, what will a man or woman give in exchange for his own soul? Many people, not knowingly, day by day, um, are making an exchange for their souls. Every thought we think, every word we say, every deed we do is in some way an exchange for our own souls. If the word of God is to be believed, godliness with contentment is great gain. Can you say amen? Godliness with contentment is great gain because we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out when we make a conscious decision to abandon the holiness of heaven. We are exchanging a little something for our souls. When we see what's right and fail to do what's right, we are exchanging a little bit of our souls. When we stand on the side of the unjust against what is just, we are exchanging a little bit of our souls. When we choose heatedness over heaviness, we are exchanging a little bit of our souls. When we decide to do what is pleasing in our own eyes rather than what thus says the Lord, we are exchanging a little bit of our souls. Now this is a tough message today, but we gotta say it. 
My brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, after all the overarching question of the gospel of Jesus Christ that lays bare before everybody who professes to be a child of God is what will you exchange for your own soul? What is it? The master asked us. What is it that is so important, that is so overarching, that is so all-consuming, that you will exchange it for a day in paradise? That is what the Lord seeks to know. Tell me, tell me, what is so important, so driving, so consuming? that you will abandon the holiness of scripture in order to obtain. What is it? Jesus is asking, what is it that consumes our thoughts to the extent that it's worth putting heaven on the side for a little while in pursuit of achieving? What is it the master, let me ask you something church, what will it be that Jesus will be able to present to the Father on your behalf? That's the question. Uh, when we make our appearance, if you believe anything in the Bible, when we make our appearance before the judgment seat of Christ, what will the master be able to say on your behalf? Yes, he ran a good meeting. Yes, he had a nice car. Yes, he could line the hymn. Yes, he could sing the song. I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters, those things will not be what you will need said. The only thing you will need to hear, the Lord say is well done. What will be your theme in glory? What are the works that will bode you well when you stand before the Savior, will Jesus be able to boast about anything that you have done while you were on this earth? At many of the services, you've, you've heard me, at many of the services that I've preached and we go to the cemetery and, uh, and we bid farewell to people who love so much. You've heard me borrow from John the Revelator, John 14 and 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me right blessed are the dead who die in the Lord even so saith the spirit for they rest from their labors and here's the catch and their works do follow them what will be the works that will follow you into God's presence will you be able to say I did the best I could with what I had. Will you be able to say I lived the best I could? Will you be able to stand before the Lord and have your works pronounced he was be good received and faithful ruler over, over many? Things. What will well, follow us as we make the grand transition from time into eternity? It will not be the earthly toys that we possess the accolades that attach our names, the trophies we have gained, the wealth we have laid up, the positions we have held, the battles we have fought, or the popularity we enjoy. It is no wonder that in Colossians 3, 1 and 2 reminds us, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He's on the right hand of God to make intercessions on our behalf. He will not present to the Father what is not worthy to enter the kingdom. Can you say amen? And then verse 2 he says, set your affections and in some translations set your minds on things above and not on earth. I've learned a few things in my life. And one of the things I have learned is everything that I can see, feel, or touch down here will not do me any good. 
once I cross over into life eternal. I have learned that the most I can accumulate down here, somebody else is going to enjoy. I have learned that no matter what people think or say about me, in the end, what matters is, is the Lord pleased with my service? Can you say amen? Uh, that might be what inspired Raymond Raspberry when he wrote, you may build great cathedrals, large or small. You can build skyscrapers, grand and tall. You may conquer all the failures of your past, but only what you do for Christ will last though your armies may control each hemisphere and your orbits out in space cause men to cheer your scientific knowledge may be vast but only what you do for Christ will last this is the essence of the text this morning to always remember church and never forget why it is that we sing our songs. Huh? Why it is that we come out to church every Sunday? While the deacons lead devotion, while the musicians play the music, while the choir sing the anthems, and while you sit in the pews, we must never lose sight of the essence of it all and place first things first. Can you say amen? We must always remember that after we raise the, the largest amount of money after we've had the grandest of celebrations after our service has garnered much attention the question is is God pleased with your living I wish y'all had me preach here today the question is not how well we look in the presence of men but are you living a life that is so worthy in the eyes of the Lord that Jesus can stand before the Father and say, here he is. He's come through many hard trials. He's come through many tribulations. His robe has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. He's had days of rising and falling. He's had victory and defeat. But through it all, he learned to trust in you, O oh God. And I present him to you faultless and blameless and ready to receive your great. This is the essence of the text. If you look at the text, you'll find Paul. The look at the text. If you're Apostle Paul here in Philippians 3, he is writing this letter to the church at Philippi. Three things that jump out. First, he begins by noting his position. Oh, yeah. And then he moves from noting his position to noting his achievements. And then he concludes by making a reference to his power. Look at the text, if you will. He says concerning, look at verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's letting you know that his position is well founded. He is regarded among men. He is favored among those in leadership. Oh, y'all, let me preach a little while. In other words, his position has gained him access and has gained him favor. He moves from there to talking a little bit about his achievement concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness. And then he goes on to say, which is in the law, I'm blameless. He moves from talking about the three things that mattered him the most. My friends, I want to tell you, it does not matter how much positions we've been able to attain, how much power we've been able to exude. It does not matter what we have been able to achieve. What matters is in the end, will the Lord be able to say, looking over the panoply of your service, I find that you have done well done, my good and faithful servant. But Paul, the apostle, does what many of us has done. After he has spent these years moving about all over Palestine, he, he had accomplished so much. He had the favor of kings. Matter of fact, if you look at Acts chapter 9, you will find that not only did he have the favor of leadership, but he had the authority and the power to act on their behalf. 
And so Paul is moving about with his accomplishment, achievement, with his power. He's moving about with all the things that he's been able to do. And something interesting happens in Acts chapter 9. What happens in Acts 9, he's telling his own words, Saul says, I was on the road and I was headed to a very prosperous location. I was headed to a place called Damascus. And while I was on that road to Damascus, something interesting happened to me. Something I did not anticipate. A light shone down from heaven. In the original translation says I was blinded by a light that surpassed what I had expected. And the light shone down from heaven and said, Saul, Saul, why persecuted? What have I done to you? What wrong have I done? Saul, oh Saul, as you are moving on your way to elevation and recognition in the eyes of the king and others, what unjust thing have I ever done to you? He looks up, recognizing the voice of the Lord because the Lord's voice is uh, so recognizable that even a fool cannot mistake it. And he says, who art thou, Lord? And the voice comes back and says, I am he. You're on your way to persecute. Now friends, something interesting happens here. As Saul encounters Jesus, he is encountering the resurrected Jesus. He is encountering a Jesus who has all power, not only to heal on this side, but to receive on the other side. And so something interesting happens. Saul begins a massive transformation. For 30 long years, we don't hear much about him for 30 long years. His achievements, his position, and his power for 30 long years. Those who had praised his achievement for having sat at the feet of Gamiel in North Africa, those who had praised his achievement, who noticed that he studied at the finest schools of Carthage located in North Africa, those who had praised his achievement had now abandoned him. Not only that, but his position, he was key to the king's program. He was zealously willing to do the work that nobody else would do. He was willing to do the politically unpopular thing and persecute the church. God, I wish y'all let me preach. He was willing to do it with zeal. He not only was willing to do what nobody else would do, but he gladly did it. He said, concerning the church, I persecuted it with zeal. But then look at his power. His power has now vanquished. He who once was on his way to persecute Christians and put them in chains is locked in a Roman jail. He was on his way to put the church in chains. Now he is chained to a Roman soldier. I want to tell you that God has a way of turning things around when it will promote his kingdom and advance his cause, God will take the high and make them low. He'll take the low and make them high. And so here he is now, 30 years later, he's sitting in a Roman prison and he looks at his resume and he says, I've seen a lot of things. I have accomplished a whole lot. I have set at the feet of Gamiel, I was qualified to teach in Harvard University concerning the Pharisaic law. I was a Pharisee among the Pharisees. I could quote the scriptures from beginning to end, but thanks be to God, something happened to me. Is there anybody here today who can remember the day that something happened to you. He says, I was on my way to persecute the church and a light shone down from heaven and blinded me and knocked me off of my beast. Now something interesting happens here, church. He says, look here at my resume. I am a Pharisee among the Pharisees. Now in today's translations, we have a very negative impression of the Pharisees. 
But in those days, a Pharisee was really somebody who was well versed in the law. Can you say amen? They had a legalistic mind. They, they knew how to go to the protocols. They were concerned with making sure things were decent and in order. They had the letter of the law, but did not appreciate the spirit of the law. For the spirit is life and health. And he says, in spite of all of that, I want to tell you my resume has changed. I had accomplished a whole lot. I had seen a whole lot. I had experienced a whole lot. I had accomplished a whole lot. But now, as I'm 77 years old, and I'm beginning to look back over my life, I now see that all of those things that I thought that mattered really don't matter that much at all. All the money that I have, I can't take with me. All the praise of other men will not raise me from the dead. All the accomplishments on my folk pace will not get me into the kingdom. And the only thing I have left is the voice of Jesus saying this right here, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And so he says, I am the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it didn't come easy. I had to rise, I had to fall, I had to win, I had to lose, I had to hurt, I had to heal, I had to save, I even destroyed, but I count all things as dung. Is there anybody here today who looking back over your life, you're able to say first things first. My money does not matter. The house does not matter. The only thing I want to know is, is God please? It's kind of interesting here. He says, I count it all as loss. In the original translation, the word is dung. I count it all as dung. Because in those days, they had a heat pile, which was located about 12 miles outside of the city. Hey, glory. And all of the waste, you know what I'm trying to say, all of the human waste, all of the stuff that had passed through, all of the garbage and all of the trash was put out on a pile called the dung pile. And it was so odorous, it was so foul that it was not fit to be inside the city gates. So they put it out there. Whatever was useless, whatever was worthless, whatever would not be used again, whatever you couldn't stand, you took it and threw it out on the dung pile. Oh, glory. And so I hear the apostle saying, everything I did in the past, it might have gotten me a whole lot of accolades. Men and women may have sung my praises. People might have recognized what I have done. Oh, but now as I'm coming to the end of my journey, I'm able to look back and say, I count it all as dung. It won't do me any good when it comes down time to press a dying pillar. Those who praise me won't do me any good. Those who love me won't do me any good. Even those who hate me won't do me any good. I count all things that I have accomplished that I have achieved, the positions I enjoy as fit to put on the pile of dung. Why so that I might gain the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I've got a close right here, but I wanna tell somebody all of my life, I have been driven by a very simple proposition for God, I live, and for God, I die. For God, I rise, and for God, I fall. It is in him that I live, that I move, 
and have my being for God's sake. I get up in the morning for God's sake. I lay down at night for God's sake. I watch my words for God's sake. I watch my conduct for God's sake. I make my decisions for God's sake. I live my life for God's sake. I walk the path for God's sake. I keep the faith for God's sake. I run the race for God's sake. I endure the toil for God's sake. I hold on for God's sake. I hold my peace for God's sake. I won't get even for God's sake. I keep on trying. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Yeah. I have a very simple proposition. It is because I want to obtain the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you look at the conclusion of the text, he says that I may somehow, look at the text if you will, that I may somehow, he's not being doubtful here. What he's saying is that we all will come before the presence of the Lord in one or two ways. Some of us would die and get caught up the Lord's resurrection of the dead and we move from this earthly plane into his perfect presence. But there will be some of us who are alive and remain until he comes, Rapusa. We shall be caught up to meet him in the air. And so what he said is whether I die an early death or live a long life one way or the other, I am, I am determined to, to make heaven my home. Can you give me about three minutes, y'all? I can remember when I was about 12 years old, I went off to a little country church, and the preacher was preaching. And when he finished, he preached about a place called heaven. And he told me that over there, the streets were paved with gold. And over there, there are leaves for the healing of the nation. And over there, the wicked will cease their troubling ways. And weary souls will finally be at rest. And ever since that day, I have been determined to make heaven my heavenly home. I ain't always right. I'm not always perfect. But God knows I always try. I don't win a hundred every time. But I try. And he says one way or the other, whether I die right now or live until he comes, I am determined to go back to meet him when he comes. Yeah. Is there anybody here who is determined to make heaven your everlasting home? 17th Street. Put first things first. Put first things first. Don't worry over small, insignificant, minor things. Don't lose your faith over personalities. Don't lose your holiness over disagreements. The only thing that matters is, is the Lord pleased with your life. I'll tell you the truth. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I'd rather be his than have houses and land. I'd rather be in love with the Savior than in love with power because when it's all over, I want to hear him say, well done. Well done. Well, well done. I'm through, y'all. I just got one question. Is the Lord satisfied 
with your life? Is he satisfied with your conversations? Is he pleased with your motivations? Is he pleased with the private conversations? Is he satisfied with your doings? Does he get any glory from what you say? Can he be seen in how you think? Can he be felt in how you move? I got to close here. I don't know when I'm going to. I'm going to tell you this. I just want to live so God can use me anytime, anywhere, whether it be here or elsewhere. I want my life to be an example of God's promise of his grace. I want to put first things first. The building will dissolve. Everything we see will turn to clay. Only what you do for Christ will last nobody 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 will be able to stand before the judgment seat on your behalf nobody, nobody no pope no president no priest nobody will be able to stand before before God on your behalf only Jesus, who is the only intermediary between God and man. The Father stands and he, he looks at you. He looks at you. Every word. He looks at every thought. He reads the contents of our heart. God sees not as man sees. Man sees the outward appearance, but God sees. He looks at the heart. And everybody and everything we thought mattered won't be there. You and the Father. And all of a sudden, Jesus steps in the middle. And it is he who will present you faultless before the Father's throne. If you are faultless, if you are not, he'll say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. You know, I don't preach a lot of Jeremiah's. But we have to put first things first. In the ordinariness, the religiosity of church, we focus on institutions and systems and buildings. And forget the foundational purpose of being here is for salvation of the soul. That's what it's about. It ain't about who's over something. It's not about who's going to tell somebody. Are you saved? That's what's important. We lose sight of so much. We don't want our church to be the church, the seven churches, but the fifth found in the book of Revelation, the church of Laodicea, who said we are rich and increased with goods. We don't need nothing. We're paid for. We can meet the payroll. We don't need and then the voice that sends from heaven through John says, Know you not that you're poor and miserable and blind because you're focusing on things temporal rather than things eternal. You don't evaluate the strength of a church based off who does what. You evaluate the strength of the church of whether or not souls are saved lives are transformed and those on the inside have made a concerted commitment to live for Jesus. That's what it's about, Deke. That's what it's about. Are we living a life that Jesus will be proudly able to present for the Father? First, keep first things first. Who, who knows? Preachers come and go. Keep first things first. If you do that, you'll make it into heaven. 
Can you say amen? My faith looks up to thee, thou lamp of Calvary. Say your divine. Now hear me while I pray. Take all my gifts away. Oh, let me from this day be holy thine. May thy rich grace impart strength. To my fainting heart, my zeal inspire, as thou hast died for me, oh, may my love to thee pure warm and changeless be a living fire let me do the last verse when life's dark maze I tread and grief around me spread. Be thou my guide. Be darkness turn to day. Drive sorrows, tears away, and let me safely go around some soul. I want to present an invitation to discipleship. If there be one who desires the leadership of the Lordship and the loving kindness and the favor that comes with the relationship, I invite you to step out and receive him to your eternal salvation. It is he. Mm -hmm. As thou hast died for me, Oh, may my love to thee, pure, warm, and changeless be. Won't you come now as we continue with our communion service from the top, Dr. Collins? My faith looks up to thee. Thou Lamb of Cal, oh Savior divine, now hear me while I pray, take all my guilt away oh let me from this 
be thine when life's dark maze I tread grief all around me spread be thou my God be darkness turn to day dry sorrows tears away A land me say the old My brothers and sisters, in the same night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and after he given thanks, he blessed it. Gave to each of those disciples around the table, saying, this is my body, which is shed for you and for many. For the mission of sins, he said to them, take and eat with thanksgiving in your heart. Likewise, at the supper, he took the cup after he had given thanks, he blessed it and gave to it, saying, this is the blood of the New Testament, the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sin. And it is much as you eat this bread and drink this wine, you show forth my death and suffering until my coming again. He communed with each of them, which was the last of their communion together. And he said, we'll do this again in the eternal favor. The body the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you now for your most blessed body and blood, consecrated now sufficiently so, that everyone who receives it will be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction. We thank you for it. We thank you for the provision that grants us access to eternal life. Consecrated now, we move against any sin or any impediment or anything that would cause us to eat or drink unworthily, thereby eating and drinking. Damnation to our own souls, not discerning the Lord's body. Blessed in all those who will receive, that they will take it by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Drinking of the wine, wine, wine. Drinking of the wine, wine, wine. You ought to been there ten thousand years drinking up oh drinking of the wine wine oh drinking of the wine wine oh you ought to have been there ten thousand years drink Oh, drinking of the wine, wine, oh, my Lord. Drinking of the wine, wine, oh, you ought to have been there 10,000 years. Drink. Oh, if my mother should look for me till her day has set me free you ought to be there ten thousand years drinking up oh drinking of the wine 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 oh drinking of the wine wine oh you ought to been there ten thousand years well, there ain't but one thing that I done wrong. I stayed in sin just a little too long. You ought to been there 10,000 years drinking up. Oh, drinking of the wine, wine. Oh, God, drinking of the wine. 
one. Oh, you ought to be there ten thousand years. Oh, drinking of the wine, 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 drinking of the wine, wine. Oh, my Lord Jesus ought to be there thousand years. Oh, Jordan River, chilly and cold, should my body, not my, oh God, you ought to be there ten thousand years. Oh, drinking of the wine, wine, oh Lord, drinking of the wine. Oh, you ought to have been there thousand years. Ought to have been there many years ago. Oh, drinking of the wine. I thank you, Father. You can abide of our Lord and say with Jesus Christ, give him for you and for me for the mission of our sins. Brother Dick in the body. The Lord. Say with Jesus Christ, give him for you and me for the mission of our sins. Take it by faith. With thanksgiving in your heart. Oh, drinking of the wine. Brother Dick in the body of our Lord and say with Jesus Christ, give him for you and for me for the mission of our sins. Take it by faith with thanksgiving your heart. You ought to have been there oh, many years ago. Amen. I don't have fingernails, so it normally takes me a little longer. Let me, let me do this. King of my life, I crown thee now thine shall the glory be lest I forget the Calvary Lead me to Calvary. Oh, lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. My brothers and sisters, in the same night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and that they gave him thanks. He blessed it and he broke it and gave to his disciples. And this is my body which is shed for you and for many for the mission of sin. Take it by faith with thanksgiving in your heart, the body of Christ. Likewise, at the supper, he took the cup and he gave him thanks, he blessed it and gave to every one of his disciples. And this is the blood of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it was the blood of, the, of bulls and goats that atone for the sins of the world. But after Christ, it was the blood of Christ that atone for our sins. This is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the mission of sin. Take it by faith, the thanksgiving in your heart, the blood of Christ. Yeah. King of my life, I crown thee now. 
thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to God. 